The Lord is calling you all. Please come in. Please come in. Please come in. Everybody, Jesus is Lord is starting now. If you would please make your way inside. All right, hello everybody, please make your way inside. For all of you guys that have your name tags, please make your way inside. Thank you very much. You should go inside. Alrighty, everybody, good evening or good morning, however you guys want to classify the day. Um, as with always, with Jesus is Lord, we should start in prayer. So we will begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the ability to gather here today after a rainy and cold day. May you fill all 
all these people here, their hearts, their minds, with the ability and the desire to love you, to worship you, and to come closer to you as we hear from our speakers tonight that you may fill them with the courage and wisdom to um, speak what's on their minds and on their hearts to everybody. In we, your name we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. All right, so the past two weeks, We've talked about how much God loves us as our Father, his capacity to love us, and what misconceptions we might have um, to receive that love. We've talked about what sin can do to us. And so to repair for that sin, we're, today we're going to talk about our solution, which is Jesus Christ, who in his obedience and in his love to die for us on the cross fulfills God's plan. Um, so we're going to have our first speaker, Father Jonathan, come up. Hey, Father, Father, tell us who you are. Oh, tell me? Yeah. What? Me? I should be in the background. Okay, so clearly I'm not Kenny up here. Um, Kenny could not be with, your, with us tonight, but my name is Claire. I am a senior. I'm studying nutrition and public health. And that's it? OK, cool. That's all you should know about me. Um, Father Jonathan, we're more interested in knowing more about you. Ooh. So the question of the day is, you have an army of kindergartners to fight. Wow. And these are smart kindergartners. They're going to go tackle you. They're going to grab at your ankles. They're going to bite you. You can't be lethal toward them. So let's just say you're, you have no capacity to be lethal toward them. How many do you think you can take? Wow. It's like such an intense, I feel put on the spot. Can I wear like steel-toed boots and like thick <laughs> like boots that they can't bite through? Okay, sure, sure. Okay, so, like if I, so if it's yes to that question, I feel pretty confident. I um, feel like I could keep, I don't know, maybe like seven of them at bay, kind of, yeah, kinda a little kicking, but not too much. I don't want to hurt them, but I just want to kind of get them away, right? <laughs> Shake them off. They're not going to be nice <laughs> to you, though. Okay. It's, a very, it's a very difficult question to answer, especially for a priest. I put on the spot. <laughs> Children are wonderful. They would never attack me. Yeah. yeah. All right, give Father Jonathan a round of applause for that. Well, Thank you, Claire. And Claire has stepped in for Kenny uh, pretty last minute. Kenny had a test tonight, so uh, we're grateful for her for being with us. Um, I, they told me I couldn't come in without a name tag, so I wore my name tag. So way to go, people guarding the door. See how we're really on top of it tonight. Good job, good job. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, how many of you joined us on Zoom last week? It was pretty fun. Uh, I really love having people respond when I talk, so it was hard to just like speak to a screen, but uh, we, had a, we had fun setting it up and all of that. So thanks for joining us um, and uh, rolling with the punches as we had uh, the winter storm and all of that. So we're looking tonight at, uh, as Claire told us, what's the God's solution to all of the mess that we saw last week? So let's kind of go back. Um, we started the first week uh, just with the basic, we're looking at the basic gospel message, right, over uh, the first part of the semester. And it begins with that God loves us. He loves you much more than you think he does. He created you because he loves you. He wants you to share in his life. Um, he created you not because he needs you, but because he freely wants to share in his life. Um, and that we, in our first parents, uh, rejected that amazing offer of love. Um, remember that quote from the catechism that our first parents let... Um, the love of their creator die, their trust in their creator, excuse me, die in their heart. That man, deceived by the serpent, let his trust in his creator die in his heart. And that's what led him, this lack of trust, led him to disobey God's command. And that brought, remember we talked about these separations into the world, the isolation, the separation from God, the separation within us, ourselves, 
right? This disordering of our will being subject to our intellect, being subject to our passions, our emotions, which is exactly the opposite of the way we were made to be. That we were created to be in this friendship with God, that now is upset. That we were created to live in communion and harmony with each other, that too has been broken. We're even created to live in communion with, with creation, with the rest of creation, and that too, that harmony was broken. And so all of this kind of uh, fallout, <laughs> pun not necessarily intended, from the fall, right? The fallout from the fall, the consequences of the fall. And it's so, so important, guys, to realize that, to recognize, this is so important for a Christian worldview, to recognize that the way that things are in the world now, in other words, everything that we see around us, everything that we know, is not the way it was intended to be. We live in a fallen world. It's really, really important to recognize that. That everything around us, the way that we experience the world, right, is not the way that it was meant to be. More importantly, we as human beings are not the way that we were meant to be, right? We live in a fallen world and we're fallen creatures. So we've lost that original harmony that we had, that harmony with God, with our, within ourselves, with other human beings, and with creation. So what does that mean? It means when people say things like, oh, well, you know, I'm only human, that's actually, like, not the full picture, right? Because to be human actually means uh, to be the person that God made me to be. What we are now, because of sin, is, is less. And the more that we give sin a reign over us, the less human we become. Sin actually makes us less human. It makes us less than what we were made to be, right? So all of our human weaknesses, this tendency to selfishness that manifests itself in a thousand ways in our own lives, in the world around us, we see it in all the headlines, that's all part of the consequences of this turn of our first parents away from God that they stopped trusting in him as a good father. They disobeyed him because they believed his commandments to be arbitrary, to be contrary to their full flourishing as human beings. And that brought chaos and brought death into the world, right? So tremendously important to recognize we live in a fallen world and that we can't fix the mess ourselves. We can't get ourselves out of that mess. So most people, most human beings, if they're honest, will recognize, like, this is not the way the world is supposed to be. Something's wrong, right? But the mistake that we make is we think, well, we can fix it, right? If we just get the right social programs, if we just kind of engineer society in the right way, and you can think of lots of isms on both sides of the spectrum that have tried to do exactly that, then we can fix it, right? Or if we just all would be nicer to each other, if we would just all try really hard to be good people, then we could fix it, right? We could live in a peaceful world. We would all just stop fighting, right? Then we could, we could, we could fix the world, right? How many, how many examples can you think of of that exact presentation of how things are, right? It's in our songs, it's in so much of our politics, right? That we can fix it ourselves. Sometimes even some of the not-so-great church songs that were written a few decades ago, it's this, right? Let us build the city of God. We can just overcome all hatred and blindness and all. It's like, no, it's not our work. We can't do it ourselves. We need a Savior. Tremendously, tremendously important to recognize we need a Savior. Things are not right in the world and within us, and we need a Savior. We need God to fix it for us. We need to be rescued, right? So my trusty assistant here, Leona, is going to go to our slides here. These are super uh, simple little uh, ways of conceiving of this, but you've seen this before, some version of this, right? This is how we were created. God created us in love to share in his life. We're in good relationship, right? Go to the next one. What happens with sin? There's this, rough, this rift, right? This rupture that we rejected our dependence on God. Remember, our creaturehood disobeyed him and brought about this separation. And the gap between God and us, a slide can't show this, but it's important to recognize that that gap is infinite. Because the love that we rejected is infinite, right? And so the way things work, kind of spiritual physics, is that when you reject an infinite love, 
Well, there's an infinite gap that's created, right? It's not just like a small little offense. It's a cosmic rupture. And so there's this infinite gap now between God and us. And what's required to heal that, to bridge that gap, is an infinite act of love. We can't do that. It's not about just, I will try really hard to be a good person. We need an infinite act of love to bridge the gap. Next slide. Where do we find that infinite act of love? It's in Jesus. So God himself provides us the answer. And it's really important to understand how this works. We say that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. What does that mean? How does that work? We're going to try to explain that a little bit tonight. Help us understand more what that means and how we can explain it to other people, right? Like why this is important for you to accept Jesus as your Savior, right? So what does it mean? Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. So he's the only one who can bridge this infinite gap between us. So how does he do that? He's fully human, so that means that he can represent us, right? That he can offer God this act of love on behalf of the whole human race. He can actually stand for all of us. But because he's fully divine, that act of love that he can offer, he's a man, and so it kind of counts as an offering of a human being. But he can do it in an infinite way because he's God. So it surpasses anything that anyone who's just merely a human being could offer, right? Because of who he is, he's fully human and he's fully God. This total self-giving love on, on the cross, and we're going to talk about that in a second, it takes on an infinite value. It takes on an infinite value. So he offers on our behalf this infinite gift of love to God his Father that restores us into right relationship. So Jesus, as the God-man, the man from heaven, as uh, there's a beautiful, actually, the song that we sang this past week in, at Mass, uh, it's in verse 2 that we didn't sing, but it talks about, for Christ, the man from heaven, has, from death has set us free. He's the man from heaven, came from heaven, the Son of God, but he's truly man, truly man and truly God. So he bridges sinful humanity and God. That infinite gift of love is the cross. Now, why the cross? Really, really important, and this is where we explain the gift of salvation and we understand it differently than a lot of our Christian brothers and sisters. It's not the case that God said, I'm really angry because you people disobeyed me, and somebody's going to have to suffer. Somebody's going to have to be punished for this awful act of disobedience. And so who's going to take the punishment? And Jesus steps up and says, I'll do it. And God, you know, takes out all his anger on his son, and then he's satisfied. That's kind of the way you hear the gospel presented sometimes, and that makes the father sound like an abusive, angry father, right? This is not the picture the scripture presents to us. Why does Jesus' cross save us? It's not just about the suffering. It's the fact that he suffers even unto death in love. It's the loving obedience of Jesus that saves the world. It's the loving obedience of Jesus that saves the world. Remember, what God wanted from Adam and Eve was a response that said, I trust you, and so I'm going to obey you. They said, I don't trust you, and so we're going to disobey you. Jesus now gives to God the response that he has desired since that day in the garden at the beginning of creation. Jesus says to the Father, I trust you. Even when I can't feel you, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is what he says on the cross, right? Even when it feels like you're nowhere to be found, I trust you. And Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And I do it out of love for them. Father, forgive them. Even the men who just nailed me to this instrument of torture, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's loving obedience that saves the world. Let's go to the next slide. Some great quotes from the Catechism. John 13, this is the reading that we hear every uh, uh, Holy Thursday. Love, he loved his own in the world and he loved them to the end. It's love to the end that confers on Christ's sacrifice. Its value is redemption and reparation. Atonement, making us one with God, at one minute, and satisfaction. He knew and loved us all when he offered his life. 
St. Paul says, Jesus died for me. Christ died for me. The love of Christ compels us, St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, because we're convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. So nobody was ever able to take on himself the sins of all men, but the existence in Christ of the divine person of of the Son, at once he surpasses and embraces all human persons. He is greater than any of us, but he's also one of us. And so he can act on behalf of the whole human race, and he can take you and me with him. He can incorporate us, that word means into the body. He can incorporate us into what he's done, which means we are also reconciled with God. Okay, so this loving, trusting obedience is exactly what Jesus offers to the Father on the cross. Philippians chapter 2, St. Paul says, have among yourselves the same attitude that we find in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at. That's what Adam and Eve did. Remember, they wanted to be like God, but without God and apart from God. Jesus is God, and yet he says, I'm going to empty myself of everything that it means to be God, all the appearance, all the, the prerogatives of being divine, I'm going to take to myself a limited human body and I'm going to be a baby in a manger that needs his diaper changed. And I'm going to get hungry and tired. And I'm going to submit to a shameful death and I'm going to allow people to crown me with thorns and spit on me. Taking the form of a slave, a human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's what saves us. He offers this act of perfect obedience. Go to the next slide. Romans chapter 5, St. Paul goes through this in detail. He says that God proves his love for us. How? That we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, he died for us. If by the transgression of one person, that's Adam, death came to reign, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of justification come to reign in life through the one person, Jesus Christ? Last line there. Through the disobedience of one person, the many were made sinners. So through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. Okay. This doesn't just end with Jesus' death on the cross, right? He rises from the dead. So he defeats death and he opens for us the way to a new kind of life. Here on earth, a life of friendship with God. We'll talk about that in a second. And eternal life in heaven. He makes us... Remember, he takes us with him. He incorporates us. And so through baptism, we become adopted sons and daughters of God. One way of saying this is that we become by grace what Jesus is by nature. By nature, he's the son of God. And yet he shares that with us by grace via free gift. You and I, allow God allows us to be called his sons and daughters. We become by grace what Jesus is by nature. Okay. Peter says, why did the word become flesh? Why did Jesus come? To make us partakers of the divine nature. This is why the word became man and the son of God became the son of man. So that man, by entering into communion with the word and thus receiving divine sonship, might become a son of God. St. Athanasius says, the son of God became man that we might become God. St. Thomas Aquinas, the same thing, that he might make man, that he might make men gods making us shares in his divinity. That's why he assumes our nature. Okay, salvation. We looked last week, remember, at all of these consequences of the fall. One way of understanding salvation, salvation means healing. When you have a wound, what do you put on it? You can put salve, right? S-A-L-V-E. It's this, it's this healing balm. Jesus is referred to in the scriptures sometimes as the balm of Gilead, right? He's the one who heals our wounded nature. So what happened in the fall? We were separated from God. Jesus brings us back into right relationship with God, right? Remember that there was that rupture within us, that our our passions rule over over our intellect, which rules our will. We're ruled kind of, we act as animals. That's restored, right? Our passions can be mastered by our intellect, and that's ruled by a will that's subject to God. Jesus, the God man, the perfect man, shows us how and by his grace he reorders 
what's broken and disordered in us. And remember how there was separation one from another, especially between men and women. This is brought into right relationship that's healed in the community of the church. The community of the church. None of this is perfect in this life. Notice I didn't mention the rupture between us and creation. Um, that lingers. We still have to struggle with sin. We still are prone to separation within ourselves. We still find it difficult to enter in communion with God. We still live in a fallen world. But we can experience the healing of all of these ruptures in the church. So that's what we're gonna, I want to end with tonight is this. It's integral to God's plan of salvation that he saves us by making us members of the church. The church is the body of Christ. We're incorporated. Remember that. We're brought in so that what Jesus did becomes for me also. The church is the extension here on earth of Jesus' mission of saving the world. Okay? So God, in the beginning of time, uh, all throughout salvation history, maybe you've done a Bible study on this, he calls the people of Israel to himself, he makes a covenant with them. All that was a preparation for what he wants to do in the new Israel, which is the church. Look at this beautiful quote from the Catechism. The Christians in the first century said the world was created for the sake of the church. The world was created for the sake of the church. This was God's plan. This community of people who were redeemed and who are brought back into an even better communion than we had in the beginning. Look at the last line there from St. Clement. Just as God's will is creation and is called the world, so his intention is the salvation of men and it's called the church. It's called the church. So how do we become members of that church? It's through baptism, right? Baptism is where what Jesus did for me, for all of us, becomes real for me. His saving death and resurrection gets applied to me because I become a member of his church, a member of his body. Everything that God has done to save us becomes true for me in my own life since Jesus comes now to live his life in me. That's what happens by baptism. And that life is nurtured and sustained and, and, and brought to more fullness by all the other sacraments of the church, okay? So really important to say yes to Jesus, which is what we're going to move towards tonight and the next couple of weeks, to say yes to Jesus, whether for the first time or the thousandth time, means saying yes to everything that he reveals to us and everything that he offers to us through his church, through his church. The church is this communion of all of the baptized and Jesus instituted it as a hierarchy. So the bishops, just as Jesus chose men and he brought the, he, and he entrusted his mission to them, they handed on that power, the succession we call apostolic succession. The bishops today are the successors of the apostles and have the power to teach in Jesus' own name everything that we need to know and everything that we need to do to be saved. And that's really, really important. We don't get saved just by me and Jesus. Jesus saves us by making us a member of his church. So we're going to talk a lot more in the latter parts of the semester about some specific church teaching, some that really are challenging for us sometimes. But what's important today to realize is we can't love the king without accepting his kingdom. We can't love Jesus but reject his kingdom. We can't fully accept Christ without accepting the church right placing our faith in him means placing our faith in him saving us through his church so that's what god has done to save us and invites us into this communion that he's established in jesus christ through his church amen thank you guys all right thank you father jonathan and that was a really powerful talk. I mean, the concept that we live in a fallen world today. I don't think that for me, I sit down and I'm like, hmm, let me think about all the ways I messed up today or all the ways that we're sinful and we're irredeemable. But we have a Savior that loves us so much and we shouldn't take that for granted, that we are able to embrace it, to live in it and be part of this community so I would like to move on to the next speaker. She's beauty, she's grace. She is Lily Ramos, our focus missionary here. All right, Lily, before we get started, same question as earlier. Army of kindergartners, okay. you're not able to be lethal. 
How many can you take? Oh my goodness. That sounds awful. <laughs> um, okay, I was actually thinking about this when you brought it up earlier. And this is kind of a lame answer, you guys, but I said four only because I have four limbs. And I think, and I'm pretty small already, so that's my answer, is four. I feel like you could take more. I feel like you, you should be with Father Jonathan, but thank you, thank <laughs> you. Awesome, thanks, Claire. Sweet, awesome, yeah. Hello, everyone, I am a focused missionary first year um, here from, actually, Florida, and I graduated from Florida Atlantic University. I studied nursing in Spanish. Um, and now I'm here, I'm excited to uh, share this with y'all and continue working with y'all, um, hopefully for another year, we'll see. Um, so I actually wanna take a couple um, of seconds here to just open up with these questions so if y'all can just sit with them, um, we'll start with that. So what does it mean for you to be saved by the cross? What does it mean to allow Jesus to be the solution to our problems? So first, let's recognize where Jesus says he is God first. At the beginning of John, it reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on, And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So we recognize here that Jesus is God, the Word made flesh. God could have redeemed us any way that he could have chosen, um, but he chose to become a man. He worked among us with his own hands, so he knew the demands and challenges of the daily grind. No doubt he was familiar with the early mornings and the late nights, um, and with much work and little rest. And I'm sure you all can relate as college students. I know I definitely did, staying up, pulling all, all nighters, and then waking up early again to do it all over again. Perhaps we forget that he laughed and cried, ate and drank, he lived and died like we all do. And if anyone here has watched The Chosen or comes to The Chosen watch parties on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. at the UCC in the library, um, you know that, um, that Jesus experienced all of our humanness. But he also chose the very nature of the human form to be the vehicle, the, ve the vehicle that would redeem all humanity from the vice grip of sin. Christ became like us so that we can become like him. So let's look at John chapter one. If so, if you have your Bibles, please pull them out um, and follow along. This is John one, chapter one, verses 10 through 13. John one, verses 10 through 13. He was in the world and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to those who did, not, did accept him, he gave power to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but of God. So there's three responses here to Jesus. So we'll look at the first one, which is in verse 10. So those who saw him but didn't recognize him as God. People saw his humanity, his goodness, his wisdom, but they didn't believe that he was God. So we know that Jesus clearly declares it in multiple ways in the gospel by his words and his actions, right? That he is God. And so... He is therefore either a lunatic or a liar, or he's actually who he says he is. So if he was a liar, he has deceived millions and millions of people, right? Like generations upon generations if he's a liar. Um, and we should fight against it, right? Against the lie that um, he made us believe if he's a liar. Or a lunatic, someone who sincerely thought he was God but wasn't. Someone whom we might feel sorry for, right, for not knowing, but not someone we'd admire or take life lessons from. There are plenty of people who think Jesus was a great guy, 
but are not willing to recognize him as God. So I grew up in a culturally Catholic family, um, and I'm sure many of you all can relate to this. Um, and what that meant for me was I grew up going and attending um, classes in preparation for my own sacraments, so my first communion and confirmation. Um, and I remember having to memorize all my prayers and learning how to, or learning about how God is good and taking little exams, um, testing us on our knowledge about our faith. And it was as if God was placed in this box for me and that I had to learn about, and I could just check it off when I was done. And what I believed at the time was that if Jesus is not just a religious teacher, but really is God, then he has authority over my life. What he teaches actually matters. I have to follow him and all that he says. And that might involve me having to change, make changes in my own, in my own life and how I live. Um, that's, that's why many people actually prefer to think of Jesus merely as a good moral teacher, someone who perhaps points us to God, um, who offers a good example, and who inspires us to be better people. To me, as a cradle Catholic, I viewed Jesus as a prophet, with my mother teaching me these prayers that I needed to know before going to bed each night. And it was just another thing that I needed to know. I had no real connection to Jesus as God. And so we contain that kind of Jesus. We can keep him at a distance. We can pick and choose what we want to accept about his teachings and set aside other points that actually challenge us to change and grow. We'll look at the second response to Jesus, which is verse 11. So some saw and recognized Jesus as God, but they didn't accept or receive him. So if you recognize Jesus as God, you have to let him be your Lord. Some can't recognize and admit their sins, so they can't receive forgiveness. They make excuses or justify their sins, so they don't realize they need forgiveness. They can easily see the sins of others, but can't accept their own. We think, oh, I'm not perfect, but I'm not such a bad person. I go to mass most Sundays, I attend my Bible study most weeks, and that must be enough. There are other people out on campus that need to hear about Jesus more than myself. For me in college, as I was having my reconversion to the faith, I was slowly beginning to believe that God loved me, but I was still holding on to this double life, this double lifestyle that I thought I could handle. I would wake up most mornings and go to daily mass on my campus, and a couple hours later, I was going out to bars or partying in Miami with my friends. And I would think to myself, I'm not really harming anyone, so I don't see why I can't continue doing this. Really. Could I really surrender underage drinking? Could I really surrender this party lifestyle that I was also pursuing? I know that I had only begun to know the person of Christ, but could I really trust him and surrender all parts of my life to him? Could he really redeem all that I have done? Could I give him my will? Could he be enough to fulfill me? Let's look at the third response to Jesus, verse 12. So some saw and recognized and received and accepted and believed him. And they received the power and authority to become God's children. Last fall, I said yes to focus. I said yes to becoming a campus missionary. By mid-November, and I was finishing my last year of nursing school with all of my friends. And as I witnessed all of them um, getting their nursing jobs before graduation, they didn't understand why I was choosing something different, something out of the ordinary for them, something that only super religious people do, and not pursue what I had just studied for the past four years. But with great joy and courage, 
I was able to share with him that not only do I want to witness the physical healing that the Lord wants for many, but to partake in the spiritual healing of those that have been chained and bound by their sins, for people to receive salvation and abundant mercy for the one who came to lay his life on the cross. Because I have encountered the person of Jesus Christ and I have received him. And it was not only the salvation of others that I desired, but the salvation that I still needed myself, ultimately for my own deeper conversion, for my own sake. I'd like to share one of my roles as a missionary here now is to lead the Women's Freedom Project ministry. And what the Freedom Project does is it helps students experience greater conversion um, by helping them overcome struggles with purity, so pornography, masturbation, uh, mental health, body image, alcohol and substance use, and so on. And I was just super excited to learn that this is going to be one of my roles here to lead this ministry because I had struggled with these, with many of these myself, and I knew that I wanted to share how much God wants to save each and every one of us from these struggles like he did with me. And the women that I get to work with know that this is how I learned to be a child of God and how I've allowed him to be the Lord of my life. And so through this experience, I came to learn that everything we do can be made good through Jesus. So that's the promise of salvation that God offers to us. If we recognize Jesus as the God man and receive him as Lord of our lives, he makes us children of God. To be children of God means giving ourselves to him, to give our anxieties, problems, difficulties, worries and concerns over to him. It means entrusting everything to the Father through him, through salvation, as Father mentioned, to be healed, to be saved, to allow Christ to carry our crosses for us. Because as children, how could we take care of ourselves on our own? Last week, as my small group and I were wrapping up our discussion about sin and consequences, Marin shared with us this quote by St. Anthony of Padua. So I'll leave you with this. Christ, who is your life, is hanging on the cross before you so that you may look at the cross as in a mirror. There you will see how mortal your wounds on are, were, which no medicine other than the blood of the Son of God could have healed. If you look well, you will also realize how great your human dignity and value are. In no other place can man better realize how much he is worth than by looking at himself in the mirror of the cross. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for those beautiful words. Um, I think it's almost scary how apathetic we can be in the world today. Um, or when we look at ourselves, we think that we're irredeemable. But as Lily reminds us, we are able to be saved by the love of Christ and that if he really is who he says he is and he is not a liar, that if he says he loves us and he wants us to be with him, we have to go full send into it, that we can't hold back and we have to meet him where he is. Um, so we'll see that in our witness talk by Gabe Mount. If you please come up here. All right, Gabe, handsome, strong, tall. How many do you think you can take in the battle royale? I think at least 100. Oh. <laughs> uh, here, here we are. So well, I, I think, okay, so I asked her and she said, if I fought them, it would be in an open field, which means I could outrun them and just circle them and then just like pick them off one by one. So <laughs> I think a pretty big group, maybe, maybe. Well, I think it could work. Good response. Awesome. Good response. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Say a quick prayer. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So when I sat down to think about what I should say tonight, um, one question came to my mind, 
And the question was, when did Christ make himself known to me? Um, and so I was reflecting on my childhood, on my high school years, on my time here in college, uh, with that question in mind, and I noticed a constant theme of his growing and ever-increasingly intense pursuit of me. Um, when I was a little, little boy, I was a really tough kid to raise. I was a picky eater. I got angry so easily, um, and I hated the seams in my socks. Um, whenever I put them on, I just like could not handle it. It would agitate me throughout the day. Uh, and my mom, when she would wake me up and get me out of bed and sit me down, would come up and put my little socks on. And when I complained about the seams, she would go and rub my little toes so that they were just a little bit more bearable to handle for the rest of the day. I had the blessing of a tremendous amount of intimacy with my mom. And yet, I struggled in my relationship with my dad. Um, I saw a lot of the imperfection and sin in myself in him. Um, and we were so alike that we would always go head to head. Um, and that strained relationship bled into my view and distrust of God the Father early on in my age. I, uh, I remember one day in second and third grade when uh, class had finished, we were all waiting outside in front of the building, waiting for our parents to come and pick us up. And I was insecure at this time in my life. I didn't really have any friends. Plus, the class was super small. There were like eight kids. Um, and some girl that day decided to come up to me and say, Gabe, you really smell like poop. Uh, and I was not having it. So I went off on her. Um, the teacher, rightly so, put me in the classroom. I felt wronged. I wasn't the one who started the, the argument. Um, and so what does an insecure, angry, emotional second grader do? He starts throwing the desks across the classroom. Uh, so I got in even more trouble. Uh, and then the teacher sat me down in the hallway. And I remember in that moment, I looked up to the Lord. And in a moment of just complete distrust and anger with him, just renounced him. Um, I accused him of injustice, of not having my best interests in mind, of failing to, to give me men to disciple me, of failing to give me what I felt I owed. Um, and yet, in the years that followed, Despite that strained relationship, I understood the intellectual arguments for Christianity, and I understood that it made sense. When I got to fifth grade, I wanted to get baptized, and I did, and it was a great gift. I was baptized in my local Southern Baptist church, um, and yet I had an impoverished prayer life. Um, it was almost as if I'd see Jesus on the side of the road and wave hello and then keep walking. I'd pray before a meal if I was with my mom, but that was about the extent of it. I knew about him. I didn't know him. That changed when I got to my high school. Uh, it was an all-boys Catholic high school called Strake Jesuit. It's actually the same school Father Jonathan went to, ironically. His, my freshman year theology teacher was his confirmation sponsor. So it's a small world. Uh, and I remember before the last class every day, the bell would ring. And if you were sitting in your, in your desk in class or if you were late on your way to class, it didn't matter, everyone would stop dead in their tracks, and a guided examination of conscience would go over the speaker. You'd have five minutes where, if you wanted to, you didn't have to, you'd have basically like a swatted time that you could use to come to the Lord and bring to him your failures that day, how you failed to follow him, the fruit that you recognize he's bared, or if you're an immature freshman like I was, you could let your mind wander and just waste the time. Um, and as I grew older there, I came to see that that was the five minutes of the day where Christ was inviting me to invite him into my life. And while I was there, um, not only did I come to just slowly but surely encounter Christ more intimately in prayer, but I encountered Christ the teacher. I remember sophomore year theology when one of our teachers, yeah, Michael's laughing, he was in class with me, Mr. Pulse. <laughs> Uh, he, uh, 
He was a man in formation to become a priest for the Jesuits, and he was a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And I remember there was a classmate of mine, his name was Kevin. And every day, without fail, after class, Kevin would go up. He was the most staunch anti-Catholic I've ever met in my life. And he'd go head to head with Mr. Pulse with objection after objection after objection. And Mr. Pulse, unfailingly, would always respond with patience, with humility, with loving eyes, and yet with firmness in giving him the answers and showing him the truth and in showing him how the Bible is a Catholic book. Um, ironically, Kevin ended up winning the Theology Student of the Year Award that year. Uh, <laughs> But it was Mr. Pulse who left an impression on me in his charity and in his commitment to the truth. I encountered Christ the teacher in Mr. Pulse. And from that community, I started to notice in myself that for some reason I couldn't tell, I was less drawn to want to go to ch the church that I had grown up to going to, and more and more I saw within myself some kind of desire to want to go to Mass. I had never encountered the Mass before. I didn't even know what most of the, the actions that the priest did, what, what, why they existed. Something or someone just began to draw me there. And yet, um, in all of those beautiful gifts that were given to me there, I was still so insistent from my insecurity in pursuing my own glorification, whether it be in basketball with my hoop dreams, or in track, or in my academics, wanting to get to the most prestigious school I possibly can, um, or in the clubs that I was involved in, our student council, there was a relentless and insatiable desire for the respect and the praises of men. And that kept me from giving Christ the time of day that he was inviting me to give him. And so when I left that school, when I came to UT, and I didn't have the five minutes scheduled in my day to, to go into that intimate prayer with Christ, I didn't make the effort to schedule the five minutes. And my prayer, was, my prayer life was impoverished once again. And yet I, I remember times when I would meet freshmen who were also raised Catholic, and I, the non-Catholic, would be the one defending the Catholic Church against the Catholics. Um, almost like, a, like imagine a boy who's got a crush on a girl, and he knows everything about her. Uh, he knows where she sits at lunch, who her closest friends are, what sports she plays, what she likes to do in her free time. And when false rumors start spreading with her closest friends, he's the first one to defend her, and yet he's never talked to her. Um, and so I kind of stuck to my default. I got plugged into the local Southern Baptist Church here that a lot of my friends went to. And despite this impoverished prayer life, I wanted to be a Bible study leader. I wanted to join the church because I wanted the respect of my friends who went there. And I remember going through the, the commitment process, the membership process of, of that church, and I got to the final step. I'd gone through the whole class that you had to go through to, to come in, and I got to the commitment step, and I read one of the lines, and it said, when you join, you agree not to teach anything contrary to what this church upholds as key to the faith. For those of you who are familiar with St. Paul's story, um, you know that before he was a Christian, he was a persecutor of Christians. He killed Christians. And when Christians were killed in his sight, he stood by and watched. If I'm not wrong, he stood by and watched as Stephen was stoned to death. And yet Christ one day blinded him on the road and said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And after reading that, that line, Looking back, I can almost imagine Christ looking to me and saying, Gabe, Gabe, why are you ignoring me? Why are you neglecting me? Um, so what followed was conviction, and for once a step or leap of faith and trust in him to actually investigate the truth of Christ and his church. And I, I, I got the best theology guys from the church that I was plugged into and then ended up going back to the, the priest's at the high school that I was from, and immediately what I encountered was Christ the truth. And having come into the community here, what I found was along the way, yeah, it turns out I'm actually a nerd. Uh, 
And what I received was a, is this ringing out? I'll just turn it off. Okay, what a powerful testimony. There are two things on my mind right now. One is that Gabe was already a force to be reckoned with at second grade. And two is how much that Jesus loves us, again, throughout the entire night. But he is always here in the UCC and any church you go to and in each other. Um, he's always here for daily mass, for adoration. And we just need to know to be intentional with how we're spending our time, even five minutes of our day. Um, he is always waiting for us, and we just need to be able to bring ourselves to him. So as we transition to Jesus and those lovely ladies over there who are going to be leading us. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, very lovely lady over there. I see. Okay. I actually don't have my glasses on. Is it okay. Okay. 
Everybody say happy birthday to Josh, too. Okay. So as I said, lovely ladies over there, um, they're going to be leading us in praise and worship, but we will have the lyrics displayed here on the projector. And you all can be remain seating because they will be able to lead us through how to pray with an open mind and an open heart as singing is praying twice. Awesome. So like Claire said, singing is like praying twice. Um, so once again, we just invite you guys to give your yes to Jesus um, as we lead you guys in this this prayer, like it's not just a song for you to meditate on, it's a song for you to pray with and to just, like Gabe said, like lifting up your heart to him. Um, and so we dim the lights and we have the lyrics and we just invite you guys to look at him. He's present there, like in the tabernacle and he's, you can look at him on the cross too and just like Reflect on him as you sing this prayer to him. Um, and if you're struggling to enter in, I just invite you guys to, to say a little prayer that I, I like saying when I, when I sing praises to him is just come Holy Spirit. Because if you ask him, he'll give you the grace to choose to enter into prayer, especially with the song. Um, once again, we can't force you to sing, but we invite you. And our God does not force you either. He just invites. So with that, oh, one last thing. I also invite you guys to open up your hands, like, on your, on your lap as just a, a posture of prayer. Um, and just, you're receiving the gift of him. So it's just a really external way to show that you are open to him in this moment. With that, let's start in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
place to choose to enter in. We just ask that you may continue giving us the grace to choose you, to say yes to you. We just ask that you may guide our conversations in our small groups tonight. Mother Mary, we just ask that you may hold our hands and guide us closer to your most beloved son, Jesus. Jesus. 